Welcome our viewers to Gaddis Rabadori program on the OMN. On this program today, we discuss about the changes made to the Kube, the Latin alphabet adopted since July 1991 as the official writing system of the Oromo language, the public reactions that followed and the implications therein. In the middle of 2015, when the Oromo protest movement was at its apex, a secretively designed project that involved changes on the Kube order for early grade primary school students was being implemented in parts of Oromia. It passed without public scrutiny because of the Oromo protests that was rocking the country by the time. But it recently was brought to the attention of the public as early grade teachers and the students' families complained about the newly introduced alphabet. To discuss about this and more, I'm joined today by our guests, Professor Rizkeel Gabisa, Jawar Mohammed, and Amanuel Raga. Welcome to the show, our guests. Thank you. Thank you, Gurma. Thank you, and glad to have you on the show. If we may start with the historical importance of Kube as a symbol of Oromo struggle for uh, the, the freedom of the Oromo people, uh, Professor Rizkeel, what, what do you make of uh, the historical importance of Kube as a writing system of the Oromo? And in fact, uh, what the scientific rationale that the Oromo resorted to choose the Kube as a as the writing system while uh, there are other alphabet systems like the Sabian or the Giz used to write other languages in Ethiopia like Amharic and, and the Tigrinya? Well, thank you very much. Uh, I think there are two major questions that you've asked me. Uh, what is the first is the first is the uh, historical importance of the use of the Kube or the Latin uh, alphabet in written the Fano Romo. Mm -hmm. And the other is uh, what was the fact, the factors that precipitated the change uh, in the 1990s. I think these are major issues that will come back to it and others add to it. But uh, with regard to the first one, um, uh, the significance of the Kobe is more than reading, it's more than writing. Uh, it has nationalistic, political, cultural, religious, uh, and other significance. Um, the Afan Oromo, until very recently, was not a written language. Uh, and it was not a written language because it was uh, not permissible in the, con in the context of the Ethiopian uh, empire uh, that was put together in the 19th century that the Oromo people were not permitted to write, to preach, to, to, to teach, to broadcast, and to expand the use of the Oromo language uh, until uh, the early 1990s. This was simply prescribed politically. There is a proclamation that came out in 1944, right after the Italians were evicted from Ethiopia in 1941, that proscribed the use of the Oromo language. So um, it's an achievement for the Oromo people to, to be able to write in their language. And there is this, this was long in development historically. Oromos have experimented in writing in Oromo language in a way that makes phonetically uh, sense, uh, in a way that even non-Oromo speakers could read by just simply looking at the, the alphabet that is used in writing. Uh, experimented with Arabic, uh, mostly in the Muslim area. Uh, they've written in, in Arabic to develop written Afan Oromo literature. Um, there was also an experiment that was done with the Amharic language, especially uh, in Bible translation. Uh, there is also an experiment in, in Latin, which began actually by Oromo slaves uh, or freed slaves that ended up in Europe in the 19th century. So it took a very long time for a written Afan Oromo to develop. And it was only after the adoption of the Kobe language in 1991 in a, a formal way that Oromo literature, written Afan Oromo literature flourished. So this is an achievement. It's, it's important, very important for the Oromo people. It's a sign of a, a nation uh, coming of age. It's an ability of bringing people together so that they could read from the same text and um, and uh, develop a nation. Something that took that long to develop 
something that required a lot of sacrifice and intellectual investment. It cannot be simply taken away by an administrative fiat. So that is one, re one reason. What is the significance of the, the Kobe? It's historical. It took a long time to come out of the clutches of the oppression that was put in uh, on the writing uh, in a final Roma. Uh, there's also a political factor here. Um, the, Oromo, the Oromo people before the 19th century were a nation that were um, monarchies in some areas, and Republican forms of government in other places, but they had some unity, cultural unity, religious unity, and political unity uh, in the 19th century. They came under the Ethiopian uh, political empire in the 19th century. And that precipitated, after maybe decades uh, uh, of a struggle, a nationalistic fervor that actually uh, made the development of Oromo uh, language, the use of the Kobe language, the Kobe uh, script, an important na goal of a nationalistic um, a drive. It was a symbol of, uh, of nationalism or the desire to be free, the desire to express oneself, the desire to choose the desire to um, express uh, one's, one's goals or political aspirations. So there is a, a political aspect or a nationalistic aspect to it. The development of Oromo nationalism is intricately and intimately related to the development of uh, the Kobe. The Kobe. That, that is to say that this is about the self-determination of the Oromo people and the Kobe stands as a symbol of the triumph of Oromo nationalism. And to tamper with <laughs> This important uh, uh, symbol of Oromo nationalism uh, is is a problem. But that is that's the importance of it. And thirdly, it's cultural. The importance of the Kobe is cultural. Language is a carrier of carrier of identity. The Oromo identity is intimately tied to the language as it is to land. It's very difficult to explain this to many people, but this is really important for the Oromo in the context of their uh, their own culture. So language or religious expressions, they, these are all done, especially in writing communication in the Kobe language. It is about cultural cohesion. It's about cultural oneness. It's about togetherness. It's about uh, uh, building a nation. So there is that cultural significance. I could go on in this respect, but these are really important to, for any listener in the English language to understand. It's not just about writing. It's just not about reading. It's about the long history of written about Oromo development. It's a long desire of the Oromo people to choose their own their destiny. It's also about cultural unity and the unity of purpose. It's about a nation that is one. It's an expression of the unity of the Oromo people. That's the importance of the Kobe language. So when we speak about the Kobe language, people try to denigrate it into re by reducing it to just the question of what kind of syllables uh, syllabary we will use, what kind of alphabet we use, it's more than that. Mm -hmm. Your second aspect of the question is, what is the linguistic rationale for switching in 1991? I must say that in 1991, when this decision was made, it was not an easy decision. In 1991, after the dictatorial regime of the, uh, the military regime was overthrown, this was an opportunity for the triumph of the centrifugal forces that had uh, brought an end to the uh, the, the dictatorial uh, military regime. In that context, it's about the nationalists, scholars, Oromo people, and what you can call 1,000 intellectuals assembled in the Ethiopian parliament, sim symbolically very important, and made a decision. Like I said, because this has a long history, I shouldn't simply say that it was a political choice. There was a linguistic rationale to it that Oromo and uh, Oromo scholars and representatives got together and made a choice, made a, a political decision, but also based in linguistic decisions. I think people who, uh, who have studied this matter know this better than I, like uh, uh, Alamayo, but they say there are three important issues that, are that, that were considered in making this decision. One is it's linguistic, that is, this this, the, the use of Latin alphabet is important in the sense that it is used in this, uh, uh, it, 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 it is quite amenable to using in, uh, 
expressing our own in writing. So there is a linguistic rationale to which to which uh, uh, um, uh, Emmanuel could come into mind. Mm-hmm. But there is also this pedagogical reason. It's it's easy to use the, um, the the alphabet. And thirdly, there is also this practical aspect, which had been in place since the 19th century. That is to say, the Latin alphabet unites Oromos with many people around the world. It also mm-hmm. gives them access to technological, scientific knowledge. Just by learning the Latin alphabet, to read Oromo or to write in Oromo, Oromo kids would be able to access a whole universe of knowledge that would be important for their own nation, for themselves, and for their locality. Thank you, uh, Professor Rizkel. Uh, May I come to you, uh, Amaniel, about this linguistic uh, issue that they say the Oromo language is written as it is spoken. This, the, the, the Kube writing system has enabled the Oromo language to be written as it is spoken. I would like you to bring to the attention of our viewers this, uh, the, the, the technical issues that made it uh, capable the language is, is written as it is actually spoken. Well, uh, thank you, Gurma, for this uh, opportunity. Um, Ezekiel has put uh, everything in order, but I'll just try to add some of the things that uh, may be of my concern in my field. Mm-hmm. Um, as Ezekiel already or, uh, put in place, uh, historical factors and uh, you know historical facts related to uh, the relationship between the speakers of Amharic and uh, Oromo has uh, influenced it in, in choosing uh, Latin alphabet from uh, the other. That's one factor. Um, the other thing is the complexity of uh, Amharic alphabet. And uh, the third factor is uh, the adaptability of Kobe to technology, like uh, Ezekiel has already uh, mentioned, uh, that uh, Kobe uh, can readily be used with computers, and uh, it can be also uh, uh, a means of uh, transition to another uh, language that uses uh, Latin alphabet. And uh, the other thing is that uh, pedagogical factors uh, like um, if we compare uh, the Amharic alphabets with uh, Kobe in number, uh, Amharic alphabet has got, is a, it's not alphabet, rather it is a syllabary, it's a syllabic uh, writing system. It's over 250 of it. And when we come to uh, the current Kobe that we, are, uh, we have adapted from Latin, it's uh, around 30 uh, uh, characters. Mm-hmm. Uh, so these are the things uh, that we have uh, uh, as uh, as uh, uh, factors for uh, choosing uh, uh, the current Kube against uh, the Amharic alphabet. But one thing is supposed to be uh, one thing is always um, the base for selecting a certain alphabet for one language. That is the will of the people. If the people wanted one character against the other, it's up to the people to choose. And so whether we have a scientific ground or not, whatever character we wanted to use represents us or represents that language. So as such, that cannot be uh, a problem and people shouldn't be asking this thing, you know, or- Oromo language or Afan Oromo is one of the, 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 the things that the Oromo people are ready to die for. When people are ready to die for a certain element of their identity, you should never question. You should accept as, the, as it is. So it doesn't matter whether, whether we chose uh, Latin or whether we chose uh, 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 some other character. If it is our choice, you cannot question. So this is our right, we can do it, so we did it. So nobody has got uh, anything in it, nobody has got a stake in it. The language is spoken by the Oromo, and the writers, the users of this alphabet is the Oromo. So it's up to the Oromo to decide, and the Oromo has decided, and there is no returning back to other things. And I would like to just end there. Thank you, Amanil. Jawar. 
As Emmanuel said, Oromos are unanimous on, on the choice of the kind of script that they would like to write their language with. But the Ethiopians, uh, I would say, are stick on problematizing this, uh, the choice of the Kube system. Uh, uh, it's, not, uh, uh, it's not strange to see a political leader, even as, uh, as recent as 2014, coming out on radio saying the Oromos should not write uh, their language in Kube and they have to uh, shift back to Amharic. And this guy, he doesn't know Oromo language. He doesn't understand Oromo language. And essentially, but he, he is com he's there to confidently prescribe what kind of script should be uh, used to write the Oromo language. I wonder what, what does that mean? Why, why don't these people are not moving on? I think the opposition to Kube comes partly from ignorance, partly from fear. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there is an assumption that uh, Oromos chose the Latin alphabet out of some kind of hatred for the Sabian or the Amharic uh, alphabet is not. The Oromos reached a decision to use uh, the Kube or the Latin alphabet after uh, a century of research. This girl has um, you know, mentioned some of it. I, I just want to go back a little bit, uh, elaborate more on that. Mm -hmm. um, the you know the research, European researchers who came to, to Ethiopia, uh, to Romo, Romo land, elsewhere in the uh, Horn of Africa, we were trying to identify you know, these languages and trying to write them. And the, particularly the German scholars uh, were in experimenting with different letters. Uh, that we start from there, from 19th century. Even among the Oromos, uh, different scholars, different groups experimented with various writing systems before we came to the Latin alphabet. For example, in 1930s, the Muslim clerks of Raya and the Wollo, they were trying to write Oromo proverbs, Oromo old stories, uh, and also Islamic teaching in Oromo language. Uh, they tried to write it in Arabic. They did write it, we still have the manuscripts. But even they, they understood, understood that it, the Arabic script was inadequate uh, to express and, and uh, you know, uh, fully uh, served the Oromo language. They noted that in, in those scripts. Uh, later on in 1940s and 1950s, another, and, you know, uh, before uh, coming to that, you know, the, toward the beginning of the 20th century, uh, his guest grandfather, you know, uh, the great Oras Maslasi, translated the Bible into uh, the Sabian, into the Amharic, uh, using the Amharic alphabet into Afan Romo. You know, he and uh, also those who, you know, use that Bible also understood the inadequacy of the Amharic alphabet to adequately serve the Afan Romo. In 1940s and, and, and 50s, uh, uh, an Romo Muslim scholar by the name of Shakri, uh, Bakri Sapalo, tried to write uh, the Oromo language using Arabic script. He realized and he, you know, eloquently argued with his colleagues that the Arabic script is not sufficient to describe, to serve the Oromo, pe uh, Oromo people, the Oromo language, because it doesn't have some of the sounds that existed in Afan Romo do not exist in Arabic. Even he tried to modify the Arabic alphabet and it didn't work for him. So he invented a wholly new writing system for Afan Romo. Come forward in 1960s, two uh, scholars independently came to conclusion that Latin was the best thing. For example, Sheikh uh, she, she Mamar Rashad uh, studied his research in, in Syria, then in Egypt, then ended up in Somalia. He engaged in intensive research and debate with other Oromo scholars of the time, saying that Arabic cannot work for Afan Oromo. Therefore, Latin has to be adapted. And he developed a, a Latin writing system, a grammar book, which the uh, uh, government of the Adbari at the time uh, destroyed it. And it did not see the light of uh, you know, publication until uh, late in 1970s. At the same time, uh, Haile Fida, who was studying in Europe, uh, who was one of the early uh, uh, Ethiopian student activists, started researching. And he didn't just come up with Latin. This guy engaged for a decade researching both Amharic and Afan Romo, trying to see if the Amharic alphabet could be adapted. Uh, a lot of people reduce Haile's role just to write in the grammar book. No, Haile engaged in intensive debate within the uh, Ethiopian student uh, movement was in North America and in Europe. He argued passionately that the writing system for Afan Romo cannot be Sabian, it has to be Latin. And those who are interested can go back. I mean, he was, he was using a lot of pseudonyms at that time, but 
the publication is still here. And those who were debating with him at that time are now, some of them have already accepted Kobe, some of them are still uh, in Addisa University and elsewhere. So the Oromos, even before Oromo started using Kobe, there was extensive debate within Oromo and with other scholars. And uh, the conclusion by 1970s was the Latin alphabet is the best, the most suitable for Afan Oromo. Then from 1970s onward, you know, the OLF adopted this as official uh, writing system, started to educate the Oromos through underground networks. By 1991, when Kube was adopted, the Oromo intelligentsia has already accepted, have learned how to use it, and quite satisfied with the fact that Kube was, you know, sufficient for Afan Oromo. Remember, they did not just accept what Haile Fida and Nishiyam Marashad proposed. They modified it and they officialized it. And they, you know, the, the, the system continued to be modified and, uh, and, and improved from time to time. So since its adoption, what now is 26 years, people like me, we started our school with, with, uh, with the Kobe and we are sufficiently literate. We are quite well educated with it. There are millions of people who went through it. I have never met a single person, a single individual, not Oromo. It's not just Oromos who are studying with Kobe today. A number of non-Oromos who live in Oromia are studying in Kobe. I have never single, seen a single soul who studied in Kobe opposing the use of Kobe or the use of Latin alphabet for Afan Oromo. Everyone is satisfied. It is those who are not familiar with the characteristics, who are not, who, are, who hasn't gone through the training, who hasn't gone through the school, who are arguing. They are just making political posturing. They are just making political uh, debates. I think this is an old debate. This is a settled issue. There is no going back. And I think I think it's quite disrespectful to say, you know, no, your language should not be written in that way, uh, mm. particularly, <laughs> particularly after, you know, a generation, a generation or two has been educated with it and they're happy with it. I think the debate is a little bit of a political and as a political, it doesn't really have a value. And I advise those who argue against this to drop it and uh, move on with the program. Mm -hmm. But but this, there is also this interesting issue that it's 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 only Afan Oromo which is being singled out to remain at the center of the debate. In Ethiopia, uh, there are about over eighty languages, and much of them are written in in Latin script, except Tigrinya, Amharic, Guragi, and Harari. But uh, we never see that uh, other languages remaining in the center of the debate as to why they actually went for or why they chose uh, this or that kind of script. Why is it only about Oromo? I would like uh, you, uh, Professor Ezekiel, to comment on this before we pass on to the next point. That's an important consideration. Uh, it's an important point. Uh, Ethiopia was supposed to be a multinational country built um, it's a, it's, it's a multinational country built through conquest and violence. Mm -hmm. So for some, for some, the return of um, most Ethiopians to speaking, when I say most Ethiopians, it includes uh, uh, people within the Ethiopian uh, state today. Uh, it is a nostalgia for, for some. There is a nostalgia of a dream of a nation lost. Mm -hmm. Look, after the Italian invasion, the Ethiopian government embarked on a policy known as assimilation, a policy that would create one nation under one language using one script. That was the nation to be built under the domination of the Amharic language, that everybody would be uh, speaking the same language, and that way the nation would be built. It probably derives from this desire to have a nation state. That program of assimilation, a policy of assimilation, which made all the official, Amharic the um, official language, the instructional media in Amharic, at least in um, uh, elementary schools, uh, written literature, newspapers, TV stations, the radio stations in, in Amharic, failed spectacularly in 1974. And there are many people who simply do not believe that uh, the Ethiopia of yesterday um, is still here, that the nation, one nation under one language, under one script would be still here. So there is this sense of nostalgia of bringing back this united Ethiopia that is historic, historic, that is 3000 years old, 
and still uh, uh, a country that was not, never colonized in, in, in Africa. There is that nostalgia. Um, but look, as, as Jawar said, this decision was a linguistic decision. It, uh, this decision was made by the Oromo people, as uh, uh, Emmanuel said. This is a, a choice, an exercise in self-determination uh, for the Oromo people. So there is no going, no turning back. But today, maybe we can uh, we can we can go back to this thing uh, later on, this subject later on. Today, it's probably introduced for political reasons. The idea of changing the Kobe, uh, the Kobe script itself is it seems like it's a backdoor way of going back to this lost dream. It's to frustrate people by by changing the order, fr frustrate teachers, students, and users. Uh, and reverse all the gains that the Oromo people have made, but they cannot do it in an upfront way. So they have to do it in a backdoor way, in a, in, a, in a concealed way, maybe using like the United States Embassy as a spokesperson uh, to defend the decision that was made. So there is still that dream that is undying dream in which political domination, economic marginalization, and establishing the supremacy of one nation uh, uh, under the domination of one hasn't, hasn't, hasn't gone. So what I'm saying is that basically there are people who still believe that nation is to be had. That nation is still in the future, not in the past. So that is, I think, what the nostalgia is, that they, we could go back to the future through uh, the replication of what we have lost in the past. So that's, that's what I think, that it's, not, it's an undying dream of a great country under uh, Amharic cultural um, uh, supremacy. Okay, th th thank you, Professor Esgel. Uh, our viewers, you are watching Gaddis Arbadori program live. Uh, I would come to you, Emmanuel, on the recent changes made on the Kobe alphabet. Take us through the details. W w what were the changes? And uh, yeah, why we have all these public reactions all the way? Well, um, this uh, discussion has been uh, uh, there for a long time now, and that's, uh, uh, we're all lying and everybody's doing the same thing. And so by now, I think everybody's informed that uh, uh, the Ethiopian government has tried to uh, change the alphabetic order of uh, Afan Oromov and make it like L-A-G something. So uh, instead of A-B-C, like Abacha, uh, the claim is that uh, they did this based on uh, the research made by the uh, USID. And uh, they said that uh, students were not able to uh, identify uh, Kube or the Oromo characters or Oromo, Oromo alphabets, and that they could not match um, uh, the sounds with the characters. But uh, everybody has uh, by now read, I think, who was able to re read uh, that, that finding. Uh, it says uh, that uh, the Oromo students um, uh, up to grade three are able to identify the characters or the letters, but they are not able to uh, compre comprehend. They have a reading comprehension problem. So um, this is uh, two different things. These are two different things. Reading and the comprehending is something. and uh, Vocalizing is another. Mm -hmm. Like the Oromo students are able to vocalize, means that they can read even sentences or words. But reading and understanding those words is another. That's where they have a problem. The second one is where they have a problem. So this has emanated from the poor education quality of the country than from the order of the alphabet. So what they did is like they negated the findings, like the first finding that says the Oromo students are able to identify Oromo characters or alphabet, and they negated it. And they, it, it means that the Oromo students are not able to identify or match characters with sounds. So they, they tried to find a solution for this artificially created problem than the reality. The reality is that the students were not able to uh, read and uh, comprehend texts. And this 
can be addressed in a different way than changing the order of the alphabets. For instance, one of the few of the, the things that uh, brought this poor education quality are, for instance, uh, uh, lack of books or teaching materials. And um, uh, in education of uh, training for teachers, and uh, a lot of other factors are there. So instead of looking for solution for these things, they try to address another issue, which has got an attachment with the identity of the Oromo people. What is a bizarre in here is that it's made by a foreign institution, a foreign NGO that has got no right to do it. They have assisted. Uh, the USAID has assisti uh, assisted the research. Also, it has assisti assisted in changing the orders and uh, printing the books. And another bizarre thing is that at the Embassy of the United States of America, which is not a, a representative of the Oromo people, rather is the representative of the United States people, is backing the, the, the Ethiopian government in doing all this sabotage. So uh, this is uh, what's the reality on the ground currently, and we can go on discussing on it. Thank you, Emmanuel. Uh, Jawar, uh, supposedly this uh, policy intervention came out of a study, a study recommendation that was uh, sponsored, as uh, Aman briefly mentioned, by the USAID. So it came uh, as part of a recommendation based on a study that was conducted on uh, early grade primary students. Uh, you have been sharing uh, the findings of this study that was, was there anything that would uh, suggest the need to change the alphabet of the writing system in the language? I think it's important to to mention why that, that research, that, that study was actually commissioned. Mm -hmm. As you know, uh, since this government came uh, to power, it has become the darling of the Western donors, uh, becoming Africa's top reci recipient of uh, foreign aid. The, you know, one of the reasons why the West was pumping money into Ethiopia, particularly during Malas' time, was because they were convinced that the country is showing results. Uh, I'll leave other sectors in a equationary uh, sector we were witnessing, I mean, the West was furnished with, with numbers and data that is beyond belief. Uh, enrollment rate for school age children was going up uh, like crazy every year. Uh, at some point, I think they were reporting 90, 95% uh, enrollment rate. Uh, schools were expanding both at elementary level and even at tertiary level. Uh, this achievement was used, you know, so it was brandished around the world to use Ethiopia as a model also to increase funding. Uh, of course, the NGOs and, and the aid organizations were trying to show the West that Ethiopia is making you know, uh, headways. Ethiopia was said to have achieved you know, the minimum, minimum millennium development goal and all that. But in middle of two, the 2000s, questions started to arise in academia and in in academic circle that these may, you know, it's not just that these numbers were cooked, cooked even if these numbers are real, at what cost? Okay, let's accept that schools are expanding. Let's accept that enrollment is increasing. How about quality? Uh, I remember I was in college during that time and, and a, a number of publications, a number of uh, conferences, a number of scholars began to question, uh, you know, the, particularly is the quality suffering. And, and, and both among Ethiopian academic as well as other academic who are studying Africa, because Ethiopia is emerging as, as as a role model, as, as a, almost a case study as a, uh, for, for, uh, for uh, success. Uh, and the USAID commissioned this research. Before the USAID, there was other researchers, but the USAID commissioned this research, and this research confirmed what a lot of people suspected. Yes, school was expo expanding. Yes, uh, enrollment was expanding, but quality was deteriorating. It was deteriorating. It was, it was worse than during the dark in terms of quality. So I think uh, if I remember correctly, only about 10% nationally, only about 10% of third graders could read 
on average level, international standard at international level. I think it's a 61 per minute or something like that. Uh, it, it was it was really really bad and it was shocking. The same study identifies a number of factors that attributed to failure in quality. Uh, chief among them was one uh, lack of reading material, particularly for the reading section. By the way, quality was bad also in maths, not just in reading, in, in sciences. For the reading aspect, they identified one, because absence of uh, both textbook and supplementary reading books. Uh, one textbook is shared by, I think, six to seven students. Uh, therefore, kids do not have sufficient access to, to uh, reading material. And also, there is no supplementary reading uh, outside classrooms, uh, in libraries and elsewhere. And the second factor they identify is... Uh, poorly trained, poorly prepared teachers, and also the teacher-student ratio. The, the, the third they identify is also the, you know, the overcrowded class uh, classrooms. They identify about seven factors. And the teaching methodology is the last and the seventh factor. So this was very controversial and this was shocking. It was dampening the enthusiasm about this great accomplishment of the government. Uh, and of course, uh, you know, uh, it wasn't taken well by the government at the time. Uh, come forward in 2014, the USAID decided to intervene on the seventh factor, not not in, a, in an increasing reading material, not in improving teacher quality, but on the seventh factor, which is teaching methodology on the curriculum aspect of it. Uh, of course, they, they issue more researches and also they start to, they decide to go to change the curriculum and they decide to uh, bring all this, uh, you know, the what is causing uh, this, this uh, controversy. We have to we have to emphasize the research in no way suggested that letter should be altered. The research in no way said uh, learning in Kube or learning in the existing order affected teacher, teacher students' learning ability. In fact, it praises that learning in mother tongue has significantly contributed to expansion of literacy in Ethiopia. The research indicated that the poor performance shown by students was caused by, you know, uh, lack of uh, reading material and, you know, poorly t- uh, prepared teachers. When we're talking about teachers, you know, th- there is something strange happening in Ethiopia. One, it is students who failed that intense grade national exam who go into short, t- t- uh, short prog- the training program and go back and uh, teach. And they're teaching on average of 80 students per class. And one teacher is teaching all four or five subjects at the elementary level. Poorly trained, poorly paid, young men and women teaching 80 students per class, and also students who don't have sufficient reading material. So the USID, instead of tackling this number one, number two, three, four, five factors, they go into intervening in the curriculum aspect. And when they intervene, when they intervene, they don't consult with the local people, they don't consult even with the local population. What do they do? They partner with Ministry of Education. They partner with Ministry of Education. They outsource the research and the curriculum design to a foreign company, foreign uh, you know institution, foreign companies like RTI and others. And also, they hire independent contractors uh, from elsewhere. One thing really need to be emphasized again: in Ethiopia, primary education is under jurisdiction of the regional government until this time until this new curriculum every textbook every exam every evaluation for primary school from grade one to eight was designed and implemented by regional bureaus and even within Oromia, for example the Oromia regional uh, education bureau has a department dedicated to preparing textbooks this department was not uh, was not consulted the regional bureau was brought on board at later stage so the usaid did not only blunder but also it, it leads you to suspect what are they thinking? Are they part of the conspiracy to weaken education in Oromia? Are they part of the conspiracy to to weaken Afanoromo learning in Oromia, as earlier suggested? So I think, and when you look at what we can discuss later on, when you look at their engagement on the last couple of days, it strengthens our suspicion about their failure and also other uh, problems they, are, they, they might be causing. Okay, thank you, Jawad. Uh, uh, Professor Skill, if I may come to you, that you can complement on the points that uh, the panelists are already saying. But on this quality of education, uh, in Ethiopia, as Jawar said, uh, education 
has been expanding at the cost of quality over the last several years. And the government apparently realized that. And since 2010, they started even to institutionally establish these quality assurance uh, offices along e universities, for example. I, I, I can... I can uh, I can talk about them because I was part of that. At least I witnessed personally. So they, they, they started to talk about quality. They started to establish quality assurance offices, QA offices. So is there any point to believe that this uh, reshuffling of the Kube or anything that's coming all along is part of this uh, awareness on the part of the government about the quality of education? I think the quality of education, the the one that you're referring to is uh, a little kind of a bit separate from what we're discussing here. Uh, you see, cooking the numbers in the case of Ethiopia is not, um, is not unique to the educational sector. But Education as one of the goals of the Millennium Development uh, Goals was important. Um, number one, for Ethiopia to claim that they're meeting those goals. Number two, to say that they um, uh, have a, a, a achievements in the Human Development Index. So it's important uh, that, that they cook the numbers. It's in economics, it's the same. In education, it's the same. And it's in the numbers that matter to them. So... Um, uh, increasing uh, uh, the number or just reporting of the numbers was uh, a goal of the the developmental state uh, in in Ethiopia because aid was dependent on that it gives them bragging rights the quest questioning of the numbers that were generated by the Ethiopian uh, government it goes to all of these uh, areas but with with reference to the um, the issue of the changes in Kobe uh, what what change uh, brought it about. Uh, yeah, quality is one thing, but I think we cannot say uh, this is why they instituted because there were iterations. <laughs> there were different explanations at different points. In fact, confusing all of us, because when it was first revealed by the Oromia TV, what was said was the reason why it was changed was that, that they only changed the order of alphabets, mm. and we thought that it was the Oromia government that actually instituted the change. Uh, and they say this is nothing with just changing the order of alphabets and it's the Oromia Regional Bureau Chief and um, some of their associates in Addis Ababa University there were trying to justify what uh, precipitated the order of alphabets that uh, Jawara talked about and I will not go into it. When they were challenged, they came up with this idea, say it's not the order of alphabet, no one can change the order of alphabet, that is immutable, that is inalterable. Uh, what we did was uh, teaching methodology. Uh, well, uh, it is teaching methodology, but all of us should be careful about uh, how we characterize what happened here, about the change of alphabet. Now we know that it is not simply the altering of the re rearrangement of alphabets from A, B, C, D to beginning with L, A, G, M. It is actually curricular change. It's a more radical change that day. So this is really a curriculum change. It's not simply uh, th teaching methodology. It's not only the order of alphabets. It is a curriculum change at the elementary level, and then it goes up to probably the university level uh, to speak to the idea that you did. So even in our characterization, now we know that it was a profound, radical change of the curriculum because the books were reprinted, the content was changed, and this has far-reaching consequences than simply changing the order of alphabet when you change content. That is to say, it's not about teaching methods and lesson plans. It's also the content of the curriculum. It's also what the students actually read when they read. It's, it's who are their heroes? What battles are they talking about? What is the content, the re religious symbols that they're looking into? So this is really a policy issue. This is not and a policy issue is a political policy change requires a political act. So there is a question of a standing and there is a question of legitimacy. Who is actually talking? Who is actually authorized to make these changes? Look, normally it begins with the family. The family makes changes, right? 
from what the students should learn, and then maybe in, in the United States is the PTA, and then the district, and then ultimately the state. In this case, when radical changes were made to the cu curriculum, we really don't know who has the standing to explain, and that is where the American embassy inserting itself into a local issue is the most, I mean, is the strangest thing I've ever, ever seen. So the question is, it's not really about the Kobe alphabet or methodology, it is a curriculum change. So it's not that profound because when you change content, you're also changing identity, you're also changing psychology, it's how people think and how, how kids evolve. That is why this is really an important issue. It is a curriculum change, not just a, a methodology or uh, alphabets, order of alphabets. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Professor Esquel. Uh, Amanel, if I may come back to you, the point uh, Dr. Esquel is also making is this is not about intervention on the quality of education. It is substantive that there are changes on the curriculum. They have changed everything. So it's not, it's, in a way, it's not an intervention that's meant to improve the quality of education. Okay? So, with this, it is clear that they have uh, changed the whole substance, the whole content of the courses, and out of that, we have public reactions. I would like you to talk about these public reactions, uh, Amanir. Okay, uh, first of all, like uh, Zikel has uh, tried to put, uh, the current actions of the USID and the Ministry of Education is, uh, uh, it's an action uh, that infringes on the constitutional rights of uh, the regions. Uh, in doing what they did, it's, uh, they, they are trying to show that uh, from now on, it's the Ministry of Education, the federal, at the federal level, that would prepare books uh, or even uh, curriculum or even redesign the uh, uh, education policy for the region. So, um, uh, this being said, when we come to the, the, the people's reactions and, uh, and uh, the answers they got uh, last time from uh, the uh, USID representatives uh, hosted by the United States uh, Embassy, it's almost similar to the, 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 the answers that the OPDO officials tried to give on, uh, on their TVs. So what they did is, uh, when people ask it, why did you do this and that, instead of addressing it, it's uh, rather they, they started with like, this is not well explained, and let's explain it to you. And uh, for one thing, what you have to pause and ask here is who are these people and why do they explain to the Oromo people what has happened? Who did it? Like, on this point, you ask a question, who did this curriculum or who prepared this curriculum? If it is the OPDO, why is not the OPDO able to explain it? And why do the United States Embassy host such a thing? It's not representing the Ethiopian people, it's representing the United States. And so there is no reason to interfere in such matters. What we see here is that the action is sponsored by the USID and then it was implemented by the federal government of Ethiopia and the Oromia Regional Bureau uh, Education Bureau is marginalized in this action. What we saw is like in the morning they told us something and then in the afternoon they changed that and then told us another another one. So one of it is like uh, one of the officials said that they forgot it. That's one. And another time he came and he said no, uh, we decided to leave it out because the volume of the book was uh, a little bit bigger. So we tried to reduce it. It's only one page, mind you. And when we go back to the forgetting thing, this is a curriculum issue. How could an institution forget things that's purposely designed? It goes through various processes before it goes to the publication stage. People 
worried as editors. There are people who are there as consultants. There are people who are advisors, and a lot of people are supposed to be there where, where, when a curriculum is designed. And how on earth would you forget a page that's very important? Mind you, what they forgot is the main thing, the alphabet. They said we forgot to include a table containing the alphabet of the language. But this is for grade one. In Ethiopia, the students start learning from grade one because most of the places do not have kindergarten. So when people come to school, they start from the age of seven, and then they, they just start learning alphabet from there. And then if you happen to forget, as they said, forget the alphabet, where on earth would these people learn the, the order of the alphabet? It was a planned action, but people ask it now, every, every, every now and then. So because of that, they were afraid to say that they did it purposely. So they said, we change it, we, 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 we forgot it, so we, we did this and that. And the, the United States Embassy, the USID uh, agents are, or representative who all answered people's questions on, on Facebook also did the same thing. They said they forgot it, so we have negotiated with these people. We told them to re re you know, replace it, so they're going to replace, there is no problem. Look, they're doing the same thing. They're trying to fool us. How on earth would people forget things like that? That's one question. And what, what, of what concern is it for the United States Embassy or for um, USID? That's another question. So we did not get the right answers yet. Like Ezekiel has already put again, this issue is not only about altering the, the, the alphabets. It goes to another issues like removing the content of the books, removing some of the stories that are valuable for the students. You know, through teaching language, you teach other issues, like identity is there, culture is there. Some other stuffs are also involved in there. If, you, if they remove these things, how on earth would students learn about themselves? So it's not satisfactory. What they're, they're doing is ridiculous. So it's uncivilized for me. This is like trying to, you know, uh, it's, it's almost like a societal, it's, 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 it's a, like a genocidal rather, not societal. It's almost like a genocidal thing. So uh, for me, it's not so satisfactory and they, they should not continue giving us the same answers. And, you know, they cannot continue fooling us. And other people are aware. All right, all right, all right. Thank you, Amani. Uh, Jawar, I would, I would, I would like you to talk on this issue that Amaniel has already touched upon. That uh, in this whole saga, you have a strange stuff that you have uh, uh, USAID and the United States Embassy in Addis Ababa, uh, in fact, becoming at the center of uh, the issue, while it is, uh, in fact, the issue is very much. Uh, of internal affairs. I would like you to talk us about this. Wh what does that mean and how that all saga ca come into the picture? My apologies, I didn't start being well talking. Uh, I, I think there are two, and I know there is a position going on towards two uh, bodies, towards two entities. One is, of course, towards the Romania Regional Government, the Education Bureau, for a number of reasons. One, for remaining quiet this long while, you know, their authority has been uh, taken away, while the, you know, the such distortion was made to the language. Uh, they were quiet. Of course, at the end, we have to be, you know, we have to be mindful. This was disclosed not by the opposition, not by the social media, not by some diaspora activists or extremists as the embassy is trying to talk about. This was disclosed by state-controlled uh, media that we understand from then we've been investigating that 
there was a dissent, widespread dissent within Oromia Education Bureau as well as with, with by, by the teachers. Because the Edu- Oromia Education Bureau was not, uh, you know, consulted. They were they did not have much of a role with it. So uh, initially they opposed it. If you if you remember that report, that report was a resistance, it was an opposition towards the, the, to to these uh, changes. Uh, but once the guns and once the threats and intimidation come in, the officials, you know, started to tiptoe the line that they've been told from the federal government. In the middle of this, that we started, that we start to witness this strange move by the embassy, uh, and therefore they became the second, uh, almost the primary target of this uh, this protest. Uh, oh. Why? There are a number of reasons. One, USAID conducted a research that showed clearly. The kids are failing at reading because of multiple other other factors. Why is it prescribing a medicine for for a, a cause you know that was something different? You know, the, uh, it's like uh, the, the 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 diagnosis shows you have a cholera, but uh, somebody is prescribing you a medicine for uh, malaria. They, they themselves, USA, USA themselves, identified a different cause for reading. What brings? Uh, what made them? come to the curriculum, one. Mm-hmm. Second, when they come to curriculum, you know, this is an aid agency. They supplement what local authorities do. They support policies and the strategies of the government, a government, you know, different uh, agencies of the government. In this role, what you see is the US, uh, the, the aid agency becoming executioner. They are playing an executive role, both in designing curriculum and also allocation of resources. In the process, they sideline and usurp the power of the local government. Particularly, we're talking about elementary education. Elementary education is just is not just about education. It's about culture. It's about values. In in a country like Ethiopia, with a very political, you know, volatile politics, with you know, albino, you know, uh, nominal self-rule coming only 25 years ago, there's a lot of sensitive political issues when it comes to. Elementary education, because elementary education is about fu- shaping the future generation. It's not just about reading alphabets and numbers. There's a lot to it. It's about shaping people. That is why the family is given priority, the teachers, then the regional government. The regional government has, if there was any area where they had some autonomy in Oromia in the last 25 years, in Oromia and elsewhere in the regional states, was education. This is the only power they had. This power was taken away from them. The USAID was not just enabling this, but actively participating in sidelining the regional government. This by itself is a serious issue, a serious violation. It's unacceptable behavior from an aid agency. Another issue is what the embassy is doing. When they start responding to the issue, they first, USAID in Ethiopia has its own website, its own Facebook page. It has its own press people. Why is it that the embassy uh, Facebook being used. They said it was USAID uh, linguistic experts who are coming, which, which we know is not true. But it just took them one day for the truth to be revealed. We know now that the person who was sitting there and responding was the press officer of the embassy. How do we know this? Because this person, by the name of Nick um, somebody, is on VOA today and yesterday arguing the same point. This is very strange. Why is USAID taking over regional government uh, power of making curriculum? And why is the embassy now stepping in, serving as, not only as a mouthpiece of the USAID, but also as a mouthpiece of the Ethiopian government? At the same time, the Ethiopian Ministry of Education remained completely quiet on this issue. Mm. In fact, a number of presses contacted them and they, re- they referred them to the embassy. This is extremely strange and it's really not acceptable. You know, I have, I've written a number of uh, updates on, on Facebook. I, I want to repeat, this is very, very damaging for uh, the United States. Why? Among Oromos and among other peoples in Ethiopia, there is a very positive view of US and its engagement in Ethiopia. Probably not in the political arena, in the development area, area in different area. People are quite satisfied and there, there is a very positive pro-US attitude in Ethiopia. But interference at this level jeopardizes that kind of positive attitude. It puts them at the forefront. It creates a clash with them and the local community. If USAID or any agency of the United States or the international community comes in, 
They have to know their role. Their role is to supplement, to support, to aid, not to transplant, not to replace, not to displace, not to dictate. What they are doing right now is they are displacing, they are replacing, dictating, and propagating a policy that has been rejected. I mean, what kind of argument is that uh, an embassy press officer argues back against us about our language? How is it that, I mean, look at one of the arguments they make. It is lack of understanding. How disrespectful is that? I mean, when thousands upon thousands of Oromo scholars review the textbooks, we didn't just follow the press report, we reviewed the textbooks. We studied it. We debated among themselves, both domestically and out here. People objected to it. To say that, oh, this is because you are ignorant, that's a disrespectful, undiplomatic, and unacceptable by any standard. I have never seen an embassy of the United States or any Western government, in fact, any embassy for that matter, interfere in domestic affairs. There's nothing more domestic than education. Interfere in domestic affairs in most bizarre way. And then be brave enough, arrogant enough to insult people. And what kind of embassy representing a democratic country would like to be a spokesperson for a tyrant? And, and to me, it's a puzzling. Why are they doing this? this Okay, why are they doing this? I believe at the press office is really sheer ignorance. But I think there might be more of it. I think this is a $90 million. Of course, there's a lot of money involved in it. There is a lot of stake. The innocent ones probably believe in the project. In the, they have a good intention. They want a success. But I think behind the good, uh, good ones, I'm sure there are those with evil intention, the corrupted ones, who are trying to you know, make, cover up the scandal cover up this intervention, cover up this blunder. It's a blunder because they are doing what is not called for, what is not demanded, what's not needed. What's needed is improve teacher quality, improve access to literary uh, literature, and so on and so forth. Change in the curriculum is not demanded. If there is a change in curriculum is needed, how should it be done? It should be under the authority of Regional Education Bureau, in collaboration and in consultation discussion with experts in each of the field, in discussion with the larger population. What we observe here is the US agency working with Ministry of Education, recruiting you know, paid consultants, preparing the books, then calling teachers, not for discussion, but giving them training how to implement. When they start, when they start you know, opposing, intimidating them and silencing them, and imposing a curriculum that was not, that was unwanted, that interferes, inter, interferes in regional affairs and also threatens a language that's still young. Romo is very young. It's only 25 years, 26 years since we started studying in it. It's a language that needs a lot of investment, a lot of uh, you know, careful development, and this kind of intervention in danger. So I think the U.S. government and the U.S. embassy, the people in the State Department need to pay very, very close attention to what's happening in El Thank you, Jawab. Uh, Professor Eskel, let's have a winding up comment as a, as a way forward that we have all these chains and the U.S. Embassy and the USID at the center of it. And such a popular rejection, in, in fact, not only among uh, the people outside the country like uh, the OMN, or, but by the primary school too. The primary teachers themselves. So you have this scenario now. What is it that uh, you would you would say about uh, that the U.S. Uh, embassy or the U.S. ID should take note of all these uh, conditions we we are talking about? I understand the U.S. embassy to be an outpost for the U.S. government. It is within the State Department, but it's also an outpost for the government. And when you look at the mission of the U.S. Embassy in Ethiopia or other missions uh, around the world, there are two things that they do. That is, they will be protecting U.S. interests around the world, but also serving U.S. citizens uh, in the country where they are posted. So these are the mission, the two missions uh, of U.S. outposts everywhere. Um, 
U.S. policy has three interests. They say it has three-legged um, um, or three-pronged um, policy. One is, the most important is security, uh, regional security, but also U.S. Uh, security. So that uh, squares with very well with protecting American um, interests. The other is development. The third is democracy promotion. These are all tied to U.S. interest and U.S. security promotion and promoting U.S. Uh, values around the world as a way of creating regional stability so, so that U.S. businesses work very well and U.S. is not called upon to act as a policeman uh, around the world. So we understand that is important for United States security. And the outpost is meant to promote this. I get it. I understand when they talk about education, assisting education as a way of promoting development, as a way of uh, helping people free themselves from want, vulnerability, and uh, degradation. We understand all of that. It also works or corresponds to the U.S. interest to promote education uh, around the world. What makes U.S. involvement in Ethiopia, particularly with the changing of curriculum in the Oromia region, is that they are not only meddling within Ethiopia's national affairs, they have gotten themselves into the level of local, local control. That is really what makes it really, really strange, especially uh, with, the, with uh, a new administration uh, in power here in Washington, D.C., that is promoting non-involvement. Uh, U.S. first, America first. Uh, what I am expecting or I'm suspecting here is why is the United States outpost getting itself into a very sensitive issue? Not only meddling in, in Ethiopian affairs and national affairs, getting, not only getting to the level of um, uh, local affairs, not only that, but really paying attention to uh, the details of secure, uh, educational changes is really, really strange for the United States that is also federal in its own structure. That is to say, the United States federal government does not meddle in the affairs of education, even in states. Why are they getting into another country's affairs? I can only suspect a couple of things. I think they have, they probably have um, gotten into some kind of corruption with the publication of books, and they, maybe there is some accountability coming, so they have to explain to the local people or to the American government, trying to cover up something that they have done at the embassy level. This is the best case scenario. The worst case scenario is maybe there is uh, instability, coming instability in Ethiopia, that the government, the central government, the local government are not in control, that the U.S. government now feels that they have to get to that level in order to restore some kind of semblance of a, uh, uh, stability. If that's the goal, if their their goal is to talk to people, and, and maybe I should say the, the one more thing. Mm -hmm. Nobody invited the U.S. Embassy to explain to anybody <laughs> about the change that were instituted. They invited themselves into it. They actually said, let's meet on Facebook and then um, uh, answer your questions. Why is it that at, the, at this level, the United States Embassy is inviting itself into getting to this issue. This is a very sensitive matter for the Oromo people. We have had an experience of the land issue last time. The United States is getting itself into a very sensitive issue and they will be they will not escape culpability if they put this this thing forward. Let me say one more thing. There is consequence if they continue to this. Number one, we're not in the stage of um, a, a proconsul like the Cromerite uh, of Egypt of the 19th century, where Lord Cromer was the, the, the man operating behind the scenes. What is the United States Embassy doing in a neo-colonial venture that they have to explain uh, local matters? If they were trying to reach the Oromo people, they have failed disastrously because none of the Oromo people actually listened to the, the vast majority of the Oromo people listen to the exchange they had in the English language. So, unless the United States is arranging itself to get into that kind of level of um, uh, scrutiny, 
they are really opening a Pandora's box, and I hope that they retract from this. Not only retract from this particular issue, but from serving as a spokesperson of the Ethiopian government. We have, my, my friends have already said this. The education, the Ministry of Education of Ethiopia hasn't come and defended this thing at all. At one level, it's just the local government that we're saying one, one thing or another, and then it's the, the U.S. Embassy. Is the U.S. Embassy the spokesperson? Is the U.S. Embassy uh, of the Ethiopian government? Is the U.S. Embassy in, is a pro-consul for the Ethiopian government? This is a very sensitive issue. So the United States is really getting into a very difficult chain. Maybe the federal government needs to pay attention to what its outpost is doing beyond promoting security and beyond uh, promoting public diplomacy for the friendship of, uh, of, of, of people in the United States and Ethiopia. They are doing something really uh, un uncalled for, unbecoming of a U.S. embassy and unnecessary. Thank you. That's all the time we have for this show. Thank you, uh, our, our panelists, for coming in and also for the, your in, insightful comments. Thank you for vi for watching. For me and Farhan Abdul Salam, goodbye. Thank you.